Well, let's go ahead and open our Bibles. I'm going to have you go this morning, 2 Peter chapter 1. And uh, one of the things I want to mention, the books, this one right here, I highly recommend. This is the best book I have ever read on uh, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's called They Speak with Other Tongues by John Sherrill. This particular one is a 40th year anniversary. They've sold millions of copies of these. This was copyrighted in 1964. I didn't want this book to end. It was the most interesting thing. And let me tell you why I encourage you to read it. It was written by a skeptic. He felt that the thing of tongues and all these things, he'd seen a bunch of nonsense, which I have too, but something kept me going. And so he set out to disprove it in some regards, and uh, he actually set some things up to see if they would take the bait on it, and it was uncovered. And so he became, he went from being a skeptic on the baptism in the Holy Spirit to being baptized in the Holy Spirit, his wife as well. So I want to encourage you to get a hold of that book. We have an online store. If you're not at Southwest or Northeast, it should be here. But this morning, let's go to first, or I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter one, verse twelve. So this today and next week, I want to talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Just what is He called to do? What is His job description, if you will? And I want to review just three points from last week, and here's the reason. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Therefore, I will always remind you about these things, Peter says, even though you already know them, and are standing firm in the truth you have been taught, and it is only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live. So, There are certain things where repetition is critical for us. It's fundamental. Some of you that are football fans, how many of you, you know, um, Vince Lombardi, you know him as a football coach, as one of the greatest, you know? And they said when uh, his team would begin to lose, it was said that he would gather the guys out, he'd get a football, and he'd hold it up and say, this is a football. And the point was fundamentals, guys, fundamentals. And, you know, effective football teams don't come up with just some newfangled runs or plays. They take those and they perfect what they're good at. You've got to have a good defense and a good offense to be effective. And they get to the point where even when the opposing team sees it coming, they can't stop it. And so there are some fundamentals that are ours in Christ that we need to go back to. There's people looking always for new this and new that. It's the fundamentals of who we are in Christ and what he's done for us. So last week, there were three things. I want to point those out again. Number one, through the new birth, through receiving the Lord, we have peace with God. Now, I know that sounds elementary. You're like, well, sure, we knew that. Peace with God. That is the greatest treasure a human being can have on this earth. Because prior to us coming into Christ, we were enemies of God. Every one of us. We were, by nature, sinful and unclean. So having peace with God, one of the pieces of armor in Ephesians chapter 6 is the shoes of peace. How many of you have ever lost your peace? It's not, we take for granted sometimes just having peace. And, and I'm telling you, when peace is taken from you, d- depending, I know there's varying degrees, it is the most unsettling thing, and you realize how powerful, how precious peace is. I think that's why drugs are so in demand because people are trying to get peace, but they're, they're just trying to cover something up. You can have peace in the midst of a storm. It's okay for you to be in the storm, just don't let the storm get in you, right? But peace is a precious thing. And so 
Paul gave these seven pieces of armor, the way I teach it, three defensive pieces, three offensive pieces, and one central to both. But the shoes of peace, the Roman soldier had shoes that had something equivalent to cleats on the bottom, like a football cleat almost. And those shoes could actually be a weapon against an opponent. So when they put those shoes on in battle, why was it? They had to have sure footing. The other thing, the shoes of peace weren't a pair of shoes like we think. They would often come up to the knee, and they would cover like a shin, like, you know, baseball catcher. You know, he'd have shin guards. And the reason for that is oftentimes Roman soldiers found themselves going through briar patches. And briar patches could be very hard on the legs and could tear you up. But when you have peace and you go through rough places in life and have sure footing, it changes everything. But when you go through things and lose your peace, if you lose your peace, you lose everything. And so why do we bring this up? Number one, you have peace with God. And when the enemy comes to steal your peace, try to steal that peace, you have to remember you have peace with God. Beyond that, you don't need much else. There are people that have peace, but they don't have peace with God. That's a very uncertain peace. The second thing we learned is you have the seal of God upon you, the seal of God. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, In whom we also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That again is a precious thing. It's something that I believe the realm of the Spirit sees. Back in ancient times when kings would send letters or precious documents, they would seal it with wax and put their insignia on that. And what that meant is, hands off. Don't tamper with this. The king has put his seal. You tamper with this, you've tampered with the king. And so the seal of the Holy Spirit, I believe, is seen in the realm of the Spirit. It also meant Rick Renner had an interesting thing to say about that Greek word. He said it was a seal placed on the package after the product had been examined and inspected to make sure it was fully intact and complete. The Lord looked at you and made sure you are fully intact and complete. You have everything that you need. He has given unto us everything that pertains unto life and godliness, and he signified it by putting the seal of the Holy Spirit on your life. One of the things I think we're going to find is you're going to discover the Holy Spirit's more at work in your life than you realize. He is with you 24-7. He is that shock absorber that the enemy tries to come and devastate God's people. The Holy Spirit is there. But we can develop our relationship and go to whole new levels with him. Verse 14 of Ephesians 1, he said that the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased prize. That word earnest literally means down payment. How many's ever bought a house and you had to put some earnest money down? What does that mean? Look, here's my down payment. I'm serious. I want to buy this thing. I will come and close on this house. God gave the Holy Spirit to say, here's the down payment. I am going to purchase this. I have purchased it. I'm closing on this. That's the seal. You're going to make it to your intended destination, which is heaven. That ought to get a good shout out of us, praise the Lord. Can't get any better than heaven. The earnest of our inheritance, the down payment, the Holy Spirit's the down payment. The Lord's saying, I'm going to close on this. I'm coming back for you. You will be with me for all eternity. So that seal of the Holy Spirit is awesome. How many religions, they serve their God or gods out of fear? Are you going to make heaven? Well, they don't know, of course, and we know there's only one way. And then the third thing that we have is the peace of God. Now, it's important that we know this because the peace of God is part of that armor that gives you the sure footing in life. Boy, there's been times I've had 
peace just tried to be taken from me. And then there's times where I've had things happen that should have devastated me and, and shaken me, and I had this something on the inside that was an anchor. Anybody ever had that? Yeah. Well, the Bible calls the peace of God peace that passes all understanding. Where when evil news comes, bad news comes, something stronger is security. Why is it important that we know this? Because this is yours. It is in you and upon you. And whenever the enemy tries to take that away, you need to understand you have to draw from this because when you lose your peace, you lose your sure footing. So now let's go to John chapter 14, verse 16. Today we're going to talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And this is interesting because when you get into John chapter 14, 15, and 16, we are literally in the most trying time of the Lord's life. It's what we refer to, he's about to enter into the passion. Now, how many saw the movie when that came out, The Passion of the Christ? You know, that's, that's not what I call one of those movies that you want to re-watch and, you know, have a great family evening again. I remember when our middle son, uh, we took all of our sons at the same time, and I forgot how old Stephen was exactly, but when we went in there, I am telling you, it's the first movie I'd ever been into that it was, it was intense. And when that movie ended, you know how a lot of times the credits start to roll, people get up at the movie house, they start talking, they start walking out, people are cutting up a little bit and stuff like that. There were so many people that didn't move. Heads were down. People were eyes closed. There were studies done on this thing that they actually put hidden cameras in theaters, these low-light cameras, and they were taking video of people that watched the scourging and the crucifixion of Christ. And I remember when Mel Gibson came out with that movie, that they were interviewing him, and he said, well, we did not depict him as he most likely looked on the cross. And he said, we had to make a decision. We didn't want people running out of theaters. Because Isaiah said that his visage, his image was so marred, he didn't even have the appearance of a man anymore. Because you have to remember, Jesus died and suffered the wrath of God in three dimensions, spirit, soul, and body. Because if it was, think about it, it says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So my thought is, okay, we need the blood of the precious spotless lamb of God. Jesus is the only one that ever had blood like that because the blood of a child comes from the Father. So forgive me for saying it this way, but why couldn't Jesus have just been cut, bled out, and, you know, spill his blood, and then that would be sufficient, right? Why was it they beat him mercilessly, they shamed him, they rejected him, crown of thorns, the Roman scourge, 39 stripes, some, I did, a, I watched a video of a forensic uh, doctor giving a report of what happens during a scourging. People died from those scourgings. That's why apparently they had 39 stripes. They said people had died on the 40th before some people had said that. But it would literally open the skin up to the bones and just threads of nerve endings, the pain, excruciating, the loss of blood, the, the shock, and, and this doctor sitting there describing. That's just the scourging and, and all that and the shame. Then the crucifixion itself was the, what they called a symphony of pain. It was one of, if not the most hideous, torturous, slow forms of death ever orchestrated by man, and the Romans had perfected it. They had, they had crucified thousands. And why was it Jesus was sweating blood in Gethsemane? Because they call that hematidrosis, I think is what the term is. But it's a time of intense stress. And it's so intense that capillaries burst, sweat mixed with blood, because it, it says in the Scripture, he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Why did he have to go through that? Because when the Lord redeemed us, 
He redeemed us spirit, soul, and body. By his stripes we were healed. Jesus paid the price for us to be healed of every sickness, disease, and infirmity. He bore our griefs and carried our sorrows so that we don't have to have the sorrow that the world has because the Bible says the sorrow of the world works death. Grief can kill a person. Dr. Summerall wrote a book. He lost five of his closest friends in a plane crash one time. They were his board members, and he wrote a book called Conquer Grief Before It Conquers You. Grief can take a person out. You have to understand that there is something that Jesus bore our griefs. How many of you know, uh, they said, Patton said this, hate paying for the same real estate twice. The worst part of carrying sorrow, carrying grief, carrying sickness and disease and all that is because it's already been paid for. The worst part of a person going to hell is the price was paid. But why was it Jesus sweat, as it were, great drops of blood? And as I studied on that, from what we can see, there's no record of all of the crucifixions that have taken place in human history where people actually got under such pressure that they began to sweat great drops of blood. It is a very rare condition. It takes an unusual amount of pressure to cause a person to go into hematidrosis. What was Jesus so under pressure about? Was it the crucifixion? Yes, it was bad. I know that. Horrid beyond what we could think. The shame, the mockery. He knew what was coming. I believe it was because he was going to be forsaken by God and that God would turn his back on him, utterly forsake him. So horrible a sight was it that the Bible says the sun refused to shine on it. And what did Jesus say on that cross? One of the saints from the cross, my God, my God, why, has you, why have you forsaken me? He had to be so you and I could be accepted. So this, this, this is the time that this is written. Jesus knows what he's heading toward in John 14, 15, 16. And you know what his number one focus is? He's there trying to get his disciples ready for his departure. Can you imagine what they went through to see him forsaken? Everybody fled from him. Think of what his mother went through. Think of what his brothers went through. They are watching their, their brother, their son, her son, forsaken, given over into the hands of the Roman government, flogged, and crucified. Can you imagine? And he says, look, the time is near. Okay, so now let's pick up just a little bit of a backdrop. Jesus was just about ready to walk into this, and what was his first and foremost concern? His disciples. He was trying to prepare them. I don't know about you. I know that there are times people go through different things, and it's like all you can do is think about yourself but Jesus, with all of that weight on his shoulder, come to bear the sin of the world, pay the penalty for sin, and he's thinking about everybody but himself. He's preparing his disciples. So let's go over here, John chapter 14, verse 16. And he says here, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him. Now look at this, for he dwells with you right now, but shall be in you. I love Rick's, uh, Rick Renner brings out some of the Greek words. The simple word, another. He said, in the Greek means of the same kind. In other words, this comforter that he's talking about is not a downgrade. It's really going to be something absolutely on par, but then he's going to take it a step further, and it's actually better. Verse 18, he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I just want to ask, have you ever found yourself in a place where you could find no comfort? I have. And it wasn't because it wasn't available to me. It was a war going on. 
There are places in life you need a supernatural comfort. You need supernatural hope. Because in the natural, hope can be gone. You may be believing for loved ones right now or a situation in your own life or you look at it and in the natural, it may be hopeless. But Romans 4.17 is the answer. Abraham, who against hope, believed in hope. We're studying down at uh, Southwest, the men's Bible study. We're going through Genesis, book by book. We just got to the place, you know, we're at Abraham and Sarah, and, and here's Abraham and Sarah, 100 years old, and the Lord says, y'all are going to have a baby. <laughs> How many of you don't receive that word for you if you're up <laughs> getting? <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Who again, That's what he was. God said, look, I'm going to give you a son. He's coming through your loins. And he looked at his driver's license and remembered his age that's hopeless. There are some of you, when you get to that, you need a supernatural hope. And so there's times where, you know, we can, we can receive comfort from friends. We can receive certain things from different ones. But there are times you hit spots in life, you need a supernatural comfort. And it's there, and it's available. And Jesus called this Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Verse 21, he says, he that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So here's the thing. The Lord reveals this other comforter is one of the same kind, of the same kind. Now, go to John 16 and verse 5, and we've We've looked at this briefly, but I want you to think about this because these are where we need to absorb these truths. This is where it needs to go from information to revelation. What do I mean? Well, information tells you what's yours. Revelation shows you how to get what's yours. Information reveals what's yours. Revelation shows you how to get or receive what's yours. Revelation is just a, a simple word for reveal. What is understanding? Just remember this. The depth of your understanding will determine the height of manifestations or the degree of manifestations that come in your life. And so it says, you know, wisdom's a principal thing if you read throughout Proverbs. Wisdom's the principal thing with all your, you know, get wisdom, get knowledge. But with all you're getting, what does it say? Get understanding. And what is understanding? Understanding is seeing what God is saying. There's, there's natural understanding, spiritual understanding. The delight of any teacher yeah. is understanding coming into the students. What does that mean? Oh, I see what you're saying. So, for instance, a child can memorize the math tables, right? But when they understand why two times two and four times four and all that, they see it and they can understand it and they can work it. They can work the problems out. That way, you know, you understand those simple math tables. You can get big math problems, but as long as you know, have certain understanding, you can work out. Okay, those are natural things. But there are certain things right now that if we could just see what God is saying and perceive it, and that's why we don't want just information but revelation. So look, John 16, verse 5. The Lord says this. So here's what he says. He's prepping his disciples the most trying time of his entire life. The reason he came to earth was to die. He's about ready to step in that. And it says here, but now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you ask me, Whither goest thou? But because I've said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Think about what he just said. He said, what I'm about to tell you is the truth. He said, it's better if I go away. Because if I don't go, the comforter will. Here, they lived with him for the last three and a half years. They slept in close quarters. They saw the dead raised. They saw him 
faced situations they had never seen another person face, and none of them conquered him. He conquered every situation. He was in a boat, a, a storm threatening to take them out, and he's asleep in the back of the boat. They wake him up. Lord, don't you even care that we're perishing? He gets up and calms the storm. And it says, what manner of man is this? They saw him feed twenty to 30,000 people with a little boy's lunch. Two pieces of fish and a little bit of bread. They saw healings. People, I don't know if we get the picture, one person pointed out that when Jesus, he had to run from people. He wasn't always trying to advertise the ministry. He'd heal people and say, don't tell anybody. I mean, they would literally throw the sick was the indication. If you look at how it was written, they would throw the sick. They'd pass them overhead and throw them at his feet and they would land healed. The Gadarene demoniac breaking chains I mean, they have spent day and night with him for the last three and a half years, and he sits there, and he tells them, now, it's better that I'm going away. How many of you know that would be something that you'd struggle with? They'd never seen a man like this, but he said, if I don't go away, he said, it's expedient for you that I go away, and the word expedient means to your advantage. How could that be to our advantage? Very simple. Can you imagine? Think of the crowds that always followed Jesus. The press that was on him all the time. And and with all of the needs of the people that you had to get in line to get an appointment with Jesus and get through the crowd. And he says, but this one I'm talking about, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, he's with you right now, but he's going to be in you. In other words, he won't be confined to one place, but whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And they can receive and be filled with that Holy Spirit. And that's why Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also. Now let's look at this other here. Go to Acts chapter 8 and verse 5. And remember, I encourage you to read several times through the book of Acts. And just make notes of when you see the supernatural. Because if you pull the supernatural out, you aren't going to have anything left of the Bible but the covers. From start to finish. Now, in time, we're going to be talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And there's, there's a group of people today called cessationists. They believe the gifts have ceased. I don't believe there's anything more unscriptural. The gifts have not cease to operate. In fact, I'm going to have a friend, uh, I've told you about Tony Cook, a friend of mine. He's got a seminar that he does now. He just earned his master's in uh, church history, and it's called Miracles and the Supernatural Through Church History. Okay, now, this is interesting. I mean, Tony and I go way back 30-something years, strong word of faith background, but He got his master's in church history at Liberty University. And I'll never forget, he called me one day and he goes, Mark, you ought to see this. I have a 788-page book I have to read of history, church history. And it's a Baptist book. But he, every once in a while, would take a photo of it, and even the Baptists were reporting throughout church history the supernatural the miracles. If you go back far enough, the Methodists had the fire of God amongst them. The Nazarenes, so many had it. But here's what basically Tony does, and and we're going to have like a Saturday morning seminar, and then he'll do a Sunday morning. He will show you that from the time of the day of Pentecost, there never has been one period of history that's been without the supernatural. There are times it's been de-emphasized. It looked like the light was out, but it never was. There's been the supernatural miracles, signs, and wonders throughout history. And the Lord has never left us without the witness of the power of God in the history since the birth of the church, which is the day of Pentecost. 
But there are this group of, and the, a lot of different backgrounds that, that they call, that they're cessationists. They believe that the gifts cease with the introduction of the early church, and that is not true. And, and there are finally some scholars, Pentecostal scholars, that have come out and just absolutely shown the uh, carelessness that some of these people that, that purport themselves to be scholar in their search of history. And you know the, the thing, too, that we have to remember. A man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. And I, I have one dear friend. He's got an earned doctorate. And dear friend of mine, he says, you know, he's from the South. And he says, you know, if you meet a Frenchman and you've never been to France, don't try to tell him there is no Paris. <laughs> And, and there's some of these people that are writing that have had no encounter with the Holy Spirit because they close off to it and they speak against it and, and, and what have you. So, but look what happens here. Philip goes down to Samaria and great things are happening. In Acts chapter 8 verse 5 it says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And listen, it was good. They received it. And there was supernatural things happening there. And then it was so powerful that in verse 8, it says there was great joy in that city. I believe this with all my heart. The visitation of the Holy Spirit and the power of God is going to be so great in these last days. It will completely change cities. I believe it will happen. Crime will go down. It can happen. Murder rates go down. Drugs dissipate. That is supposed to happen because we are salt and we are light. And when the supernatural power of God begins to flow, that can happen. All Malongo, Guatemala, we watched that one night, the little documentary on it. It is absolutely a miracle what has happened down there in that area. And it was because they got a hold and dealt with the idols down there and the Spirit of God began to move and people to be Began to get saved. And there's a saying, I have a friend from Guatemala, and, and they said, if you were a bad, bad alcoholic, they called you an Almalongan. And you would drive through the town, and starting around lunchtime, people passed out everywhere. Jails packed full. They interviewed the, um, the sheriff down there, or the police officer, whatever he was. They had so many people in jail, they used to have to put them on buses and, and take them off to nearby towns. And all of a sudden, and the men would beat their wives and treat their families horribly and stuff like that. The move of God. A friend of mine used to live down there, and it was powerful what happened. He said, it was a supernatural. The jails absolutely emptied out. They interviewed the police officer down there, and it was just that one area. The crops began to get bigger. This is all documented. This is not some evangelist, you know, stretching things out or what have you. It's documented in a documentary. A friend of mine has been there. I've been to Guatemala. I've never been to Almalongo, but I want to go to visit it because apparently it's still going. When the power of God shows up, things begin to change. God doesn't coexist with the devil. He begins to drive that out just by virtue of his presence. The church is the answer to our problems today in this world. And if we'll go back and look in history, it's, it's everywhere that wherever people get a hold of the Lord. Let's keep going now. Here's what I want to share with you just before we close today. There is a separate and distinct experience of receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, hear my heart. If you are born again, you have the Spirit of God within you. Because the Bible says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. But there is a separate and distinct encounter that I believe God desires us, and it's throughout Scripture, and we're going to see it right here. Because Philip goes down to Samaria and preaches, and the power of God begins to flow. But let's read a little bit further. Verse 14 says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. So people are getting saved. They received the word. They didn't reject the gospel. 
They went and uh, they sent unto them Peter and John, verse 15, who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Verse 16, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Are you seeing that? Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. So here's the thing. People can be born again, but there is a separate and distinct experience. It doesn't mean you're not saved. You have God living within you. And for anybody that has ever said, if you don't speak in tongues, you're less of a Christian, that is wrong. Quite honestly, I've seen some ministers that are not baptized in the Holy Spirit, don't speak with other tongues, and they have a whole lot more of God than some Pentecostal crazy friends of mine have. Are you following me? Just because you speak in tongues doesn't mean you're spiritual. You could be as carnal as they come. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues, and speaking in tongues is not the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit, there is a separate and distinct encounter that you can have with the Holy Spirit, and it is called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We'll do a little bit of a study because Jesus said in, in uh, Mark chapter 16 about baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Greek word used there was not the Greek word bapto, it was baptizo. Well, what does that mean? The best way to describe it is there was a Greek poet and physician named Nicandor or Nicandor. And he said the analogy was that of taking a cucumber and dropping it into a vinegar solution to make pickles. The word baptizo means to overwhelm. And I remember growing up in West Texas and my mom, they used to, they used to you know, can the pickles, get the mason jars, and it was an all-day affair. And so they'd take the mason jars and they would uh, boil those things and get them real nice and clean. And, and then you get the mason jar uh, little lid things and you would put those. But what they would do is they would, they would take the, the cucumbers and dip them in hot water, but that was just the dip and they bring it back out. Anybody ever done this before? We got some people in here? Okay. So they would dip that. That's the Greek word bapto. You baptize them. You dip them in, but they come back out. But what is about the word where Jesus said, go ye into all the world and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was the Greek word baptizo, which means to overwhelm. So after they took the cucumber and dipped it in the hot water, they would pack those down into the jars and baptizo them in a vinegar solution. And you remember they'd put them in the, the, the thing and then all of a sudden, you know, you'd uh, put the lid on and I'll never forget, then they would uh, start, you know, they'd make that noise, you know, and then you knew they were sealed, right? But what happened is the baptizo word means a permanent state, a permanent submersion. You and I are to have the presence of God in our lives and that people, when they come into contact with us, that they sense there's something different. I'm not talking about being spooky. I'm not talking about being weird. I'm not talking about acting foolish or just given an outbreak in tongues. There's been a lot of nonsense in Pentecostal churches, and it was a miracle I stayed with it because I'd go in these places and want to work my way out the back door, <laughs> coming off the platform and off the pew. And here's what I want to do is take this weirdness out of it Amen. because tongues is not people's idea. It's God's idea. It's God's design, and it's for our empowerment but you know what? You can offend people by being insensitive. And I'm not talking about compromise on this. The Holy Spirit is sent to help us and lead us and guide us into all truth. And there, I believe the Lord has taken us to a place in the body of Christ where we're going to start seeing people getting saved in an unprecedented manner. 
We're going to look back in history, just recent history, where when the move of God begins to happen, we see people sweep into the kingdom of God. Look over here. Let's, let's close up on this. It says in Romans 8, 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We'll pick up there next week. We've, we've got to learn to be led by the Spirit. It can save our lives. But there is a relationship that the Lord desires for each of us to have with the Holy Spirit. Let me just say this. Yesterday, you know, I did the funeral of a young man. You heard me talk about the Haddock family. That's real special to us because the Haddocks have been with us from day one when we became senior pastors in 1987. And got a call a week ago yesterday, Saturday night, from Rob asking for prayer because his 16-year-old nephew they had just found him pinned under an ATV with no heartbeat. And Rob worked on him for 30, 40 minutes. Took the ambulance 30 minutes to get there. And uh, it turned out he'd been laying under that thing for probably a couple, three hours. So Jackson was gone. And, and yesterday they had a small private gathering at the house and asked me to do it. And I'll tell you what. I needed the Lord yesterday. I really did. Um, you know, that's why this morning when we were exhorting just to have a thankful heart because um, that, was, that was tough yesterday. A 16-year-old handsome young man with nothing but life and love and potential in his heart and watching two brothers say goodbye, watching a mom and a dad, aunts and uncles, and uh, we, you know, I guess one of the things that hit me yesterday is I said, Lord, you got to help me with this. And, uh, you know, the preacher's not supposed to cry. How many of you know that? <laughs> and yet when you're close to a family, you, you feel their pain. The Holy Spirit makes all the difference in the world as we go through life. But we are to live and we have the capacity to live at a whole new level of living. We aren't here to just cope. We aren't here to just scrape through. We're here to live a life that exemplifies the very life of Christ. Greater is he that's in us. And so we have to realize that we need to receive all that he has for us, the weapons he's created for us, the blessings, the tools that he's given us, Take advantage of everything that's ours in Christ. It's like this. Every one of us have a bank account, but you have to know how to withdraw, and you have to know what's in that bank account. Isn't it a pleasant thing when you find out there's a whole lot? Have you ever forgot about any money and then went, oh, there's more in there than I thought? Isn't that a good thing? Well, guess what? We have the unsearchable riches of Christ. So as we take these steps along, let's open our hearts up to all that the Lord has, and let's close with a word of prayer here this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, and Lord, we pray that we will tap into all that is ours, all the treasure you have, Lord, and that we will lift up out of the doldrums of life, Lord, the valleys and ride on the high places of the earth, Father God. We pray in the name of Jesus that everything you have for us, Lord, we receive it in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you, Lord, for what's ahead in the body of Christ. We thank you for the great outpourings of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that are ahead in Jesus' mighty name. And we give you the praise and the honor and the glory. And everybody shouted, Amen. Amen.